The Saudi Pro League has been making waves in football over the last 10 months. And by making waves, what I mean, of course, is that four state-owned clubs have literally spent a billion dollars on new arrivals, throwing more money at those players' contracts than they did on contracts with British arms firms in order to bomb kids in Yemen. The likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, Karim Benzema, and Neymar Jr. have all headed desert side, signing contracts that are without precedent in the history of world football. Meanwhile, Lionel Messi and Kylian Mbappe are reported to have turned down even more money than them. Saudi Arabia is a country of over 35 million people, which, in a European context, makes it roughly the same size as Poland, twice the size of the Netherlands, and over three times larger than Portugal. Given that Saudi Arabia's population is also among the youngest and the most male-dominated, I mean, in terms of the ratio of men to women, though also in other ways that we need not get into, you might have thought that those signings, combined with Saudi Arabia's demographics, would have resulted in packed out crowds the length and breadth of the kingdom. Well, I'm afraid to say that you would be sadly mistaken. As some of you may have seen, last weekend's game between Steven Gerrard and Jordan Henderson's Al Etifak and Al Riyad, where former Watford striker Andre Gray and Real Betis Loney Juanmi now play their club football, attracted a crowd of just 696 people. That's fewer spectators than turned up to watch a game between Clitheroe and Newcastle Town over the same weekend in the eighth tier of English football. It comes as a crushing blow, no doubt, to Jordan Henderson and his one-man crusade to spread the game of football around the globe. The former Liverpool captain must be distraught. Personally, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he simply handed his wages back now due to the overwhelming sense of guilt. Gerard and Henderson's Al Etifak weren't alone in Saudi Arabia in playing in front of a pitiful crowd last weekend, though, nor have they been throughout the rest of this season. In fact, that wasn't even the lowest attendance of the weekend. A game between Al Hazam and Al Rayed attracted a crowd of just 532, meanwhile, the lowest attendance this season came in Al Okdud's 2 1 win against Al Riyad last month, when only 133 people turned up. There are Sunday League teams playing on park pitches that attract bigger crowds than that. The highest attendance last weekend came at the King Abdullah Sports City Stadium, where a crowd of 16,919 turned out to watch Roberto Firmino and Riyad Mahrez's Al Ali take on Odia Nagalo's Al Vakta, which is still considerably fewer than the 21,552 that went to watch Bradford City over the same weekend in the fourth tier of English football. Overall, the average attendance in the Saudi Pro League so far this season has been just 8,510, which is significantly lower than the average in both the Skybet League 1 and in Germany's third league. Outside of the Big Four, who are all owned by Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, which also owns 80% of Newcastle United, there is not a single Saudi Pro League team with an average attendance of more than 10,000 so far this season. Stadiums in the Saudi Pro League, so far this season, have been, on average, just 30% full. Or, you know, 70% empty, depending on your perspective on life, I suppose. The viewing figures online and on television are, if anything, even less impressive. So just what on earth is going on? Why is no one watching football in Saudi Arabia, either at home or abroad, despite a summer of investment which was even more extreme than the form of Wahhabism that Saudi Arabia seeks to export to the rest of the world? Well, in today's video, that's what we're going to try and figure out. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Dammam, Riyadh, Mecca, Medina, and Jeddah, not literally, of course. I would rather not be hacked to pieces with a bone saw. As we take a look at the Saudi Pro League's attendances, why they are quite so low, and what could be done to improve them. Some people may look at the crowds in the Saudi Pro League, even after the league has signed some of the biggest names in world football, and conclude that most Saudis must just not be very interested in the sport. But that is not the case. Anyone who witnessed the level of support that Saudi Arabia enjoyed, 
albeit on their own doorstep, at the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, will know that there is not only a great number of Saudis who are very passionate about football, but also that they can create a fairly raucous atmosphere. Football is believed to have been brought to Saudi Arabia by British merchants and missionaries in the late 19th century, and though a Saudi Arabian football federation, and therefore, an official Saudi Arabia national team, didn't exist until 1956, Saudi Arabia's oldest club, al had, who now employ the likes of Karim Benzema, N'Golo Kante, and Nuno Espirito Santo, were founded in December 1927, almost a hundred years ago. Football rapidly became the most popular sport in Saudi Arabia, enjoying a burgeoning fan culture, meanwhile the Saudi national team are among the most successful in Asia, having reached a joint record six Asian Cup finals, winning three of them, and six World Cups, a tally which is bettered only by South Korea and Japan within the Asian Football Confederation. For decades now, the biggest fixtures in the Saudi football calendar, which are primarily the Riyadh and Jeddah derbies between Al-Hilal and Al-Nasir and Al-Ali and Al-Itihad, have attracted crowds in the tens of thousands. Meanwhile, the finals of the Spanish and Italian Super Cups, which have both been held in Saudi Arabia several times in recent years, always draw crowds in excess of 50,000. There is perhaps a temptation, or laziness, that leads some people to amalgamate all West Asian or Middle Eastern states into one big authoritarian and monarchical bloc, but doing so overlooks several important distinctions and nuances, which includes, but is by no means limited to football. Saudi Arabia is not Qatar, which also twice hosted the Supercoppa Italiana, and was never able to attract a crowd of more than 14,000. Whereas Qatar has a third of a million citizens, plus about 2.3 million migrant workers, Saudi Arabia is the fifth largest country in Asia by area, and the largest in what is often referred to as the Middle East. Unlike its Gulf neighbours, with the exception of Iraq, Saudi Arabia doesn't lack inhabitants or football fans, nor is it devoid of long-standing, passionate, and vocal football fandom. The lack of fans at Saudi Pro League games, therefore, can't be explained away quite as easily as some of you might have thought. While Saudi Arabia has a decent-sized population, though, that population is incredibly spread out. The landscape of Saudi Arabia consists primarily of arid desert, lowland and mountains, and it is among the least densely populated nations on Earth. In fact, Canada, Russia and Argentina are the only countries with larger populations that are less densely populated than Saudi Arabia, and unlike in those three countries, Saudi Arabia's metropolitan areas aren't particularly closely congregated. The west of the country, home to the cities of Jeddah, Mecca and Medina, is the most densely populated region, but even then you're talking about over a four hour drive between the two holiest cities in Islam. Riyadh, meanwhile, the Saudi capital, is a ten hour drive from the nation's second city of Jeddah, and it's a further four hour drive on from there to reach Stephen Gerrard and Jordan Henderson's new home of Daman. Even Riyadh, which is the largest city in the region with a population of over 7.5 million people, is not a modern metropolis in the style of London or New York. It is a sprawling city, which has a single row of high-rises, surrounded by low-lying residential buildings for as far as the eye can see. Riyadh province, meanwhile, where the next largest city is home to barely 100,000 people, covers an area of more than 400,000 kilometres squared. That is three times the size of England. All of this is relevant because it means that, though Saudi Arabia is home to over 35 million people, many of them live nowhere near any of the nation's top flight football stadiums, and even some of those who live in cities with Saudi Pro League teams, like Riyadh or Jeddah, the latter of which is larger than either Bangkok or New York, despite having fewer than half the number of inhabitants, you could still face a two and a half or three hour round trip just to watch home games. Meanwhile, an Alte supporter is looking at a 33 hour drive there and back to watch their team take on Alokdud. Even Plymouth fans would balk at that. 
there are other logistical challenges to attending matches in Saudi Arabia. Right now, for example, this season's average attendance of 8,510 is lower than last season's average of just over 10,000, which is pretty extraordinary given the players that have joined Saudi clubs in recent months, but attendances are actually up about 25% year over year when compared to this time last season. That may seem a little unusual, but it is currently summertime in Saudi Arabia, in which temperatures tend to range from around 30 to 43 degrees Celsius, or 86 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, for any American viewers out there. Saudi Arabia's football stadiums, as things stand, are a far cry from the state-of-the-art venues that hosted the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, in the winter no less, and accommodated supporters in relative comfort. Certainly, in a greater degree of comfort than the people who built them were accommodated in at least. The King Abdullah Sports City, nicknamed The Jewel, and home to Jeddah duo Al Ali and Al Ittihad, is the only major modern football stadium in Saudi Arabia, built at a cost of $560 million, and opened in 2014. The only other modern venues are Al Nasser's KSU Stadium in Riyadh, where Cristiano Ronaldo plays his football, which is still smaller than League Two sides MK Dons and Bradford City Stadiums, Damak's tiny little 5,000-seater open-air stadium, which opened in 2017, and the 12,000-seater Prince Haklul bin Abdulaziz Sports City, which opened its doors in 2020, 12 years after construction first began, another single bowl open-air stadium with a running track around it, which plays host to both al Dud and Najran. The rest of the Saudi Pro League stadiums like Etifak's Prince Mohammed bin Fahd Stadium or Al Riyadh's Prince Turkey bin Abdulaziz Stadium were built in the 1970s or 80s and have been relatively untouched since then. I mean, just take a look at Al Majmak Sports City, which is one of the league's newest stadiums, opened in 1990, and the permanent home of three Saudi football clubs, one of whom, Al Faya, competes in the Pro League. Now, without wanting to cast any aspersions, I might suggest that Sports City is slightly too grandiose a name for a single rickety old stand and four massive floodlights. But then again, Al Majmah is a city which has a population of just 45,000 people, which makes it a little bit smaller than Dunfermline in Scotland. Most of Saudi Arabia's stadiums are currently not very hospitable environments then, especially not in 40 degree heat in the middle of summer, when you've got a two hour round trip just to get to the game. It's also worth noting that Al Majmak, for example, and Al Faya, whose average attendance this season is less than 3,000, are based in Riyadh province and are just two hours from Al-Hilal's King Fahd International Stadium, and even less from Al Nasser's Al-Awal Park. Although Saudi Arabia does have a very distinct football culture, that football culture is very different to the one that exists in Europe, and especially in England. Support among Saudi football fans is much more intensely focused on Saudi Arabia's big four, namely Al-Hilal, Al-Ali, Al-Itihad, and al Nasser than most European football fans can probably comprehend, even in Spain, where Barcelona and Real Madrid are such behemoths compared to everyone else, it still doesn't come close. The likes of Betis, Bilbao, Atletico, Sevilla and Valencia all enjoy significant support despite the outsized influence of those two. But in Saudi Arabia, the enthusiasm for a club like Al Riyadh, who are Al Hilal and Al Nasser's unloved neighbours, is bordering on non existent. Al Riyadh's average attendance this season is just 2,139, the second lowest figure in the Saudi Pro League for a top flight football club based in a city of almost 8 million people. Saudi Arabia's enormous investment has not only done nothing to increase the enthusiasm for clubs like Al Riyadh or address this imbalance, in some ways, it has served to do the precise opposite. In June 2023, Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund, known as the Public Investment Fund, or PIF, assumed control of the nation's four largest clubs. 
pretty much all Saudi Arabian football clubs, like most things in Saudi Arabia, were already de facto state-owned or at least state-controlled. But PIF's position formalized things at those four clubs and facilitated unprecedented state investment in the sport. Those four have therefore each hoovered up a handful of superstars in recent months, whilst most clubs have remained relatively unchanged. Whereas Al-Hilal have appointed George Jesus and signed Ruben Neves, Alexander Mitrovic and Neymar Jr. And Al Nasser have signed Marcelo Brozovic, Sadio Mane and Americ Laporte to play alongside Cristiano Ronaldo. Their local minnows, Al Riyad's biggest signing, has been Didier and Dong, a man who is best known for being fairly undong himself after Sunderland paid a club record £13.6 million to sign him in 2016. The Saudi Pro League was already unbalanced, but PIF's investment has made the gap even more striking. Al-Hilal are yet to lose a game this season, and recently put six goals past Al-Riyad in a turgid affair played at walking pace. Meanwhile, al Nasser struck five past Al-Fateh in their own backyard without breaking a sweat. And in 40 degree heat, that takes some doing. Saudi minnows may see increased attendances when they host one of the big four, as fans turn up to get a glimpse of Neymar or Ronaldo, but outside of those four games a season, it is quite plausible that their support and attendances could actually decline as that gulf further widens. The gulf between the haves and have-nots in Saudi Arabian football is reflected in the attendance statistics. A crowd of over 59,000 turned up to watch Al-Hilal's opening game this season, which was a one-all draw against Minnow's al Fayer, compared to the 133 fans who turned up just two weeks later to watch Al-Riyad host al Okdud in the Saudi capital. Just as most people supporting just four clubs, rather than necessarily their local team, is part of Saudi fan culture, so is picking and choosing which games to attend. That means, routinely, that big games see massive bumper crowds like Al Halal's opening game of the season or Neymar's debut, and less attractive fixtures see enormous drop offs. That doesn't just go for smaller teams when they're not playing against the big boys, it applies equally to the big four themselves. Al Halal, who usually play at the almost 60,000 capacity King Fahd International Stadium, but are currently housed at the 22,188 capacity Prince Faisal bin Fahd Stadium, recently saw their attendance fall from almost 15,000 for a 2 0 win against Al Shabab to only 8,505 for a 1 0 win over Al Khalij in their next home fixture. The reason for that drop off, you ask? Well, because between those two home matches, Neymar Jr. was injured on international duty. The loss of Neymar meant the loss of around 6,000 fans, or over 40%, of Al Halal's crowd from the previous match. Again, much of this will seem inconceivable to a European audience, but it is important to note that, in this respect at least, Saudi Arabia is not alone. In Egypt, or Saudi Arabia's mortal enemies Iran, for example, it is a similar story, with the likes of Al Ali and Zamalek, or Persepolis and Estegal, hoovering up enormous support whilst others feed off scraps, and big games selling out some of Africa and Asia's biggest arenas, whilst less attractive fixtures, can result in almost entirely empty grounds. Nonetheless, even taking all of these factors and various considerations into account, attendances in the Saudi Pro League are still low, and they haven't increased in the way in which the league and the House of Saud would have hoped. The will, no doubt, be those who say that Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman won't care. There are other issues at play here. Whether that be soft power, establishing Saudi Arabia as the principal cultural and sporting hub of the Arab world, and winning the right to host the 2034 World Cup, all of which are reasonable points. But they overlook one of the main reasons why Saudi Arabia's ruling family has invested quite so much money in football. Saudi Arabia has a young population. About half of the country is under the age of 25. An extraordinary economic growth fueled by oil exports over the last 50 years has created a small but growing educated and middle-class bourgeoisie. Young populations and disempowered, or at least 
non-ruling, educated bourgeoisie classes are pretty much the two most important ingredients or determiners for this quiet unrest and revolution in authoritarian and monarchical states. Saudi Arabia is just about the most authoritarian and monarchical society left anywhere in the world, and the House of Saud is well aware of the risks that the country's demographics and socioeconomics could pose to them in the long term. Saudi Arabia's population, and particularly young people, are also incredibly enthusiastic about football though, and the enormous state investment in the sport is very likely, at least in part, to be an investment incurring favour amongst that demographic and keeping them on side. The lack of initial enthusiasm, and lower than anticipated crowds therefore, is likely to concern the House of Saud given the sheer scale of their investment and one of their probable primary aims. Then you have the issue of television and online viewing figures, which are a less exact science in terms of measuring, but would, at first glance, appear to be even more concerning for the Saudis. In August 2023, the Saudi Pro League sold its global broadcasting rights to 12 networks covering 130 countries. Those networks include Canal Plus in France, Sony Sports Network in India, and DAZN in Austria, Belgium, Canada, Germany, and the UK. Both the Saudi Pro League and IMG Media, the British business which negotiated the deals, and also negotiates the Premier League's broadcast rights, refuse to reveal how much the deals were worth, most likely because they're tiny. It has been suggested that the deal is four times as large as the league's previous international broadcast deal, but given that only eight people outside of the Gulf had even heard of the Saudi Pro League a couple of years ago, that's not saying much. It's reported that the DAZN deal, for example, which includes the rights to broadcast the league's games in five countries, including the sizable markets of Germany and the United Kingdom, was only worth £500,000. That's not even enough to pay Neymar's salary for two days, and he's just been ruled out for the next eight to ten months with an ACL injury. The reality is that, in most of the world, and practically all of the world's most lucrative markets, Almost no one is going to choose to watch a Saudi Pro League game over a Premier League or Champions League fixture, and for very good reason. What the Saudi Pro League should have done, and I am fairly surprised that they didn't, is make all of the league's games free to air worldwide and able to be easily streamed across multiple platforms with no rights or copyright restrictions whatsoever for at least the first five years. As I said, if the calculation is the Premier League versus the Saudi Pro League, with all else being equal, almost no one is watching a Saudi Pro League game. But if the calculation is watching a Premier League game at considerable cost, or watching a Saudi Pro League game for nothing, suddenly the dynamic changes. More people will still watch the Premier League game, a lot more in fact, but amongst the young and those struggling with the cost of living, which is an awful lot of people worldwide, you could begin to make serious inroads. Older football fans, and by older there, I am sad to say that I'm including myself, and indeed pretty much including anyone over the age of about 21, and even that might be generous, are unlikely to start frequently watching Saudi Pro League games under pretty much any circumstances. Fans in Europe and South America likewise are going to be extremely difficult to convert just given the deeply ingrained football culture that exists there and the pathways that tend to lead them into fandom. Younger supporters however, particularly in less developed markets, from a football perspective, could provide much more fertile ground for the Saudi Pro League had they been a bit more tactful in their marketing and distribution. Some of you might be thinking, broadcast games for free with no copyright restrictions? That can't be sustainable. And in the case of the Premier League, for example, you would be spot on. The reality, however, is that the Saudi Pro League will generate next to nothing through its broadcast deals, and by creating a barrier to entry at all, they are pretty much guaranteeing that most football fans worldwide will never even interact with or take any active interest in the division. The Premier League is marketable because of its clubs, the narratives, the quality of football, and the entertainment. The Saudi Pro League's most marketable asset, at least outside of Saudi Arabia, is the league's star players. 
Very few people want to watch Alok Dude versus Al Khalij for 90 minutes on a weekend, but there are plenty of people, strange as most of you watching this, or I may find it, who would watch a game if it was free and easily accessible just because Cristiano Ronaldo is playing. There are even more who would watch clips or highlights, especially with commentary from streamers that they follow and the like, of big name players scoring goals or being involved in notable incidents. Not only are the Saudi Pro League's broadcast deals likely to be worth almost nothing at this stage, and making games free to air a more strategic option in the long term, if done right, I suspect that it could be more profitable even in the short term. If the Saudi Pro League streamed all of their matches, or at least all of the Big Four's matches, for free on a platform like Twitch, and generated an engaged audience of young people, I'm not joking when I say they could probably make more money through people paying for things like emotes in the comments, and for other forms of access or engagement, than they are likely to generate through 12 pitiful broadcast deals in countries where no one cares about the league. The Saudi Pro League's total annual revenue right now, from all sources, is less than £100 million. That is less than the individual team that finishes bottom of the Premier League receives. Even the Saudis' own stated internal ambition is only to reach an annual revenue of £400 million by 2030. That's not even enough to cover Cristiano Ronaldo, Neymar and N'Golo Kante's salaries. The Premier League, by comparison, already generates £5.5 billion a season, and rising. The Saudi Pro League would have very little to lose, therefore, by targeting a younger and more online audience, rather than operating through conventional channels, which has so far yielded, put generously, not very good results. Even the league's online content, which is free-to-air, has been fairly abysmal. The Saudi Pro League's official YouTube channel, which has fewer than half as many subscribers as me, some guy in East Yorkshire, making documentaries about the downfall of the Bosnian national team, and in the last six months, I have more videos about Saudi Arabian football, which have reached over 100,000 views than them, and I've only made four of them. Well, five now, I suppose. Here's hoping that this one does better than theirs as well. On average, the Saudi Pro League's match highlights do well to scrape 3,000 views. They have got interviews with Karim Benzema and Riyad Mahrez, with fewer than 6,000 and 4,000 views respectively, which is almost an achievement in of itself. I could make a video interviewing a potato while claiming that it was Ian Dowie, and it would get more views than that. The point being, not that Ian Dowie looks like a potato, that is not what I meant at all, and I wouldn't wish to insinuate anything of the sort. He was very nice when I met him, despite being absolutely rubbish during his brief stint managing Hull City. But that given Saudi Arabia's investments in football, this is my real point, it is fairly spectacular how poorly they have managed the star power that they now have on their hands, and how atrociously the league has been marketed. I've talked about this before, but there is this idea that Saudi Arabia is this all-powerful behemoth with limitless resources that can do whatever it wants. The reality is that it has a lower GDP than Australia and the Netherlands, a lower GDP per capita than Belgium and Canada, and a smaller sovereign wealth fund than Norway and Kuwait. Saudi Arabia generates vast resources through exporting oil, but it is not the richest country in the world, by any metric, and it faces some pretty severe headwinds as the world moves away from fossil fuels, and as it is forced to contend with increasingly unlivable temperatures in that part of the world, due to that transition not happening anywhere near soon enough. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman recently stated that he didn't care about sports washing, but economics, and that, quote, I have 1% GDP growth from sports, and I'm aiming for another 1.5%. Call it whatever you want. We're going to get that other 1.5%, end quote. It is a worthwhile point that sport can make economic sense, especially for a country that needs to diversify more than just about anywhere else, but football does not currently make any economic sense for Saudi Arabia. The Chinese economy is, roughly speaking, about 20 times the size of the Saudi Arabian economy. China invested much less money in football than Saudi Arabia, 
most of which wasn't even directly state resources, and saw greater returns and higher attendances in return for their investments. Nonetheless, President Xi Jinping and the CCP very quickly decided that football was demanding far too much capital outflow for far too little reward, and they slammed on the brakes. Saudi Arabia has different priorities to China, different motivations for investing in football, and may well prove to have the stomach to sustain far greater and longer-term losses within the sport. But it doesn't have limitless resources, and at some stage, if football is simply sinking state resources into a black hole, they are likely to reach the same conclusion as Xi. It may well be the case that Saudi Arabia's extraordinary spending was just one final push to ensure 2034 World Cup hosting rights, which are now all but guaranteed. And either when their bid is confirmed as having been successful, or after hosting the tournament, Saudi Arabia scales back. That would create the rather unusual scenario, however, that at the very moment that Saudi Arabia is likely to have hospitable modern football stadiums and improved transport links, conducive to getting more fans to attend games, that is when they pull the plug on their football project, which would seem a little counterintuitive, at least on the face of it. Finally, it is worth noting that one of the biggest problems for the Saudi Pro League, even if it hadn't been horribly marketed and distributed, which it has, is that the product they're selling just isn't very good. Fans aren't idiots. Or, you know, most of them aren't. And as much as marketing is important, you need only look at the Premier League in the early 2000s for an illustration of that fact, so is quality and entertainment. And fans don't want to watch Dross when they have no emotional investment in the teams or the storylines involved. There is also an element in which matchday attendances and viewing figures tend to have a symbiotic relationship. Empty stadiums provide terrible optics for television, as has previously been a problem in Serie A and in La Liga. That's why clubs, leagues and broadcasters like to fill seats around the pitch first, which are most often in shot, to give the illusion of a stadium being fuller than it really is. TV audiences want packed crowds and good atmospheres, and when they see empty stadiums, either consciously or subconsciously, they tend to think that if locals and supporters don't give a damn, then why should we? A handful of Saudi Pro League teams are capable of creating excellent atmospheres, even in small numbers, but stadiums run at between a quarter to a third full, which is just abysmal. That creates yet another problem in terms of attracting and motivating players. Of course, for everyone other than football's crusader Jordan Henderson, the primary or only motive for moving to Saudi Arabia is financial. And that will remain the case, regardless of television or matchday attendances. There will be those, however, who look at Lionel Messi selling out venues across the United States, even in a so-called retirement league, when compared with some of the soulless dust bowls in Saudi Arabia, and question which they would rather, even if it came with a financial hit. Messi is one of several players to have decided that the negatives outweigh the positives in Saudi Arabia, and poor optics and attendances are likely to convince several others likewise. Don't underestimate the extent to which footballers feed off a crowd. We saw that during the COVID-19 behind closed doors season. Elite level footballers are used to playing in front of big crowds, and they feed off that adrenaline. It is one of the things that they find hardest to deal with when they retire. He won't say it publicly, but there is no way that Jordan Henderson doesn't miss playing in front of over 50,000 fans at Anfield every week when he steps out in front of fewer than 700 people. At a crowd lower than that of any team in the National League, the fifth tier of English football. Anyhow, that is why attendances and viewing figures are so low in the Saudi Pro League, why it is problematic for the Saudis, and why they should have hired me to carry out their marketing and distribution, if it wasn't for the fact that I would say no, and they tried to kill me with a hacksaw the second that they saw any of my previous videos. That is it for today's video, though. Hopefully it doesn't get me killed. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, or found it remotely interesting. I hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and of course,
goes without saying. Make sure that you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be on or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at hidcc 7s on all three. And all of those links, plus everything else that matters in life, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.